Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. We are back with another installment of our NEMO Stormwater Seminar Series. I'm here with one of our stormwater experts as part of this initiative, Dr. Steve Souza, who is the owner of Clean Waters Consulting. So without further ado, you can take it away, Steve. Great. Well, thank you, Avery, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to be talking about riparian buffers and how they are important in terms of the overall restoration of Barnegat Bay. Now, one thing uh, what we will be covering today is what's a buffer. Um, I will uh, get into that. I'm not going to get into too much detail in terms of environmental and legal definitions, although we'll touch on that a little bit. But I'm going to function primarily on their ecological functions, which are their environmental benefits, how they serve the environment. And then also uh, their ecological services, their societal benefits, how they help us out. Uh, in, in terms of interacting with Barnegat Bay. And then we're going to take a look at an example of riparian buffer restoration. So what I'm not going to cover, though, is any of the specifics as it applies to DEP's uh, definition of riparian buffers or how those buffers are delineated or what activities are allowed or not allowed with with. Uh, within riparian buffers. We're going to be looking at this more from an environmental perspective and the benefits that these buffers provide to the streams and rivers that drain to Barnegat Bay. So let's start off with a general uh, definition uh, that was developed by US EPA and that has been adopted uh, by New Jersey DEP. And it's essentially when we talk about riparian buffers and riparian areas, these are the vegetated ecosystems that exist along the border of a waterway. And the importance is that of these riparian buffers uh, are that they channel energy materials, which would be like nutrients and sediment, and also uh, are a, a functional way for water to pass from upland areas through uh, wetland areas and into a receiving system. Uh, so in a way, they're a combination of both wetlands and uplands. Uh, when you uh, will look at some uh, diagrams of riparian buffers, but these include floodplains, as well as some of the transitional uplands that are adjacent to floodplains. And when we talk about riparian buffers as being part of a riparian area, you can kind of like hone that down a little bit further because what we're talking about are the lands that are immediately adjacent to a stream. So that's one way to think of it. But as I said before, the importance of these buffers are that they serve as natural filters. There are ways, as I mentioned, by which energy materials uh, are channeled and recycled. Uh, and in that capacity, they help remove a variety of different types of non-point source pollutants, as well as help mitigate some of the flood-related impacts that affect streams and waterways, as well as the properties that are adjacent to those streams and waterways. The DEP's definition of the riparian zone uh, can be obtained through the uh, flood hazard rules, which are NJC 7 colon 13. And you can see they're very similar to EPA's uh, definition, essentially lands that are adjacent to a surface water. And that would include lakes as well as streams and rivers. Now, as some of you probably are aware, uh, the width of that riparian zone differs. Uh, it can be as little as 50 feet or as great as 300 feet. And that's on both sides of the waterway, whether measured from the center of the channel or from the top of the bank. And the difference in the width is really a function of the uh, uh, quality of that water, whether it's a category one water, which would be considered to ha have the highest uh, degree of quality, uh, or if it's a non-C1 water, non-category one water, uh, but still uh, it's offered these uh, protections, these buffer areas, uh, and those, in those cases, it would be a 50-foot uh, buffer. Uh, and this would apply to any stream, uh, creek, uh, that collects runoff from at least 50 acres of land. So you can see even small headwater streams are going to have a riparian zone. Uh, and any naturally concern, uh, occurring stream, as per DEP's definition, that has a discernible channel, that is a measurable bed and bank, no matter how small that area may be, that's draining to that stream. So 
There's two different ways to look at this from DEP's perspective. Number one, is it a waterway that has at least a 50 acre catchment or drainage area? Or is it a waterway that has a measurable or discernible channel that is a bed and bank? Um, and uh, in that case, it doesn't make a difference how small the area is that's draining to the streams. And that's very important because that provides the protections for these headwater streams where streams originate and become flowing waters. This is just a general schematic. And here you can see that how this concept of the riparian buffer or riparian zone, however you want to define it, includes portions of the floodplain. And it could also include portions in some cases of adjacent upland areas, as I mentioned previously. Now, as I mentioned, this is really where we should focus on thinking about the ecological services and the ecological functions that riparian uh, areas provide uh, to the environment. Uh, e ecological services are attributes that have some, so uh, some type of societal or cultural benefit. So they're benefiting us. It could be flood protection. It could be habitat that uh, we use for birding or some type of active or passive recreation. Uh, ecological functions are actually the attributes that yield some type of an environmental or ecosystem benefit. So getting back to thinking about the uh, uh, interception of nutrients and then with that, the development of these uh, uh, vegetated ecosystems adjacent to the streams that uh, can harness some of that erosional energy during storms, provide habitat for a variety of different species, aquatic, semi-aquatic, as well as upland species. So this is a very important attribute of riparian buffers. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper into this, I've provided on this slide a couple of publications that talk specifically about the ecological services and the ecological functions of riparian buffers and their importance uh, in the management and protection, as well as restoration of waterways. So sticking to that theme, here are some of the services and functions that are provided by buffers. As I mentioned previously, flood mitigation and resiliency, aesthetics, passive and active recreation, all fall under that column of ecological services, whereas ecological functions, but you can see here, this is more of an environmental attribute uh, whether it's habitat for aquatic or semi-aquatic species, uh, the removal of, uh, of organic material and channeling of that energy that uh, you can get from that uh, stored uh, organic material. So how do they function? And that is really what we need to be you know, concerned about when we talk about restoration of and protection of, re of these riparian buffers in the, uh, for the waterways that drain to uh, Barnegat Bay. So in an undisturbed floodplain and riparian corridor, uh, there's the ability for flood events to jump out of the bank, out of the channel of the stream, and then flow into these adjacent vegetated areas. And uh, that's where you end up with a lot of both ecological functions and ecological uh, uh, processes that benefit streams as well as us. In a non-impaired riparian stream corridor, what we find, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you'll have to uh, edit that out. <clears throat> All right. With a non-impaired riparian stream corridor, uh, the channel itself is very stable. And this is because it has the ability that vegetation along the edges, that riparian buffer, to dissipate energy, to control flooding, intercept pollutants, and then provide habitat. So the long and short of it is that when we have a non-impaired riparian buffer, it's highly re resilient to storm flows. Uh, and that benefits us on a societal, uh, from a societal standpoint, as well as benefiting the environment. As we lose stream channel resiliency as a result of encroachment or damage to that riparian buffer, what we find now is that even by simple basic types of activities, such as clearing to create more agricultural land, filling to create more developable land, uh, that whole ecosystem becomes far less stable. 
uh, it's more prone to erosion. The adjacent properties are more prone to flooding. And as a result of that, we end up creating these ecological impairments that impact both the function and the services that are being provided by that stream and adjacent vegetated zone, the riparian channel, the riparian zone. And this is, you know, what we see. Any of you that take a casual walk through even a suburban stream are likely to see evidence of alteration of the landscape, which would be like sort of indicative of, of what's happening up in the right hand uh, corner, uh, top right hand corner where, you know, people have cleared and then subsequently filled in the edges of that, that riparian buffer. You can see this is a very sterile type of an environment. Does it provide much opportunity for uh, any type of habitat? And as you can see, even with that photo on the top right hand corner, we already have bank subsidence where the banks are failing, they're, they're being eroded. Uh, as that occurs, uh, we end up with more pronounced erosion, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And then that leads to eutrophication issues that increase the amount of algae uh, that are present in the stream, uh, and also the amount of nutrients and algae that occur within Barnegat Bay proper. And under worst case scenarios, uh, that can lead to some significant ecological impacts, even fish kills. So how does land development impact riparian buffers? Well, you know, as we alter these landscapes, we change the hydrology and that results in too much or too little water flowing into our streams. Well, how does that happen? How can I have either too much or too little? Well, when I clear that land and put impervious cover on top of that land, now I'm generating more runoff. So I've altered the hydrology by increasing the amount of volume that ends up entering my stream. As I put more impervious cover and compact those soils and clear the vegetation along the perimeter of my stream, now I'm impeding the ability for precipitation to actually soak back down into the ground, to infiltrate. So now I've decreased the amount of infiltration. That leads to less uh, water available in that superficial aquifer, which provides the base flow for my stream. So you can see where the clearing and alteration of that riparian buffer can either increase the amount of runoff that's being generated, uh, as well as decrease the amount of infiltration, and both have con uh, negative consequences on our receiving streams. That also changes the hydraulics. So when we talk about hydrology, we're talking about volume. When we talk about hydraulics, we're talking about the rate at which that water passes through that system. And as evidence in those previous in the previous slide, a couple of those pictures that showed bank erosion, bank erosion occurs because of water flowing through that system too quickly. Then you have the physical damage, clearing and filling. That's a loss of habitat. Oftentimes, when we start those types of activities by clearing and filling, that increases the opportunity for invasive plant species to colonize. So now we've lost some of the ecological value of that of that system. The lack of canopy, no trees now, uh, that increases water temperature. That has an, a, negative, a negative effect on the fish life in my stream. That also makes those streams more conducive to algae blooms. They heat up, uh, and now I put more nutrients into that water and that simply uh, ends up uh, really stimulating more algal growth. And as we develop, we end up with other problems associated with pollutants that enter, whether they're nutrients, hydrocarbons, heavy metals, et cetera. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, at the end of all of this, we, we end up with ecological impacts and societal impacts. So losses, of both the ecological services and the ecological functions provided by that stream. So it's a simple way to look at this, just like what goes around comes around, something as simple as some minor watershed development that leads to clearing and filling creates an alteration of the hydrology and the hydraulics of our system, uh, an increase in, in uh, pollutant loading. The, the combination of all of that leads to degraded water quality and habitat. 
And then that in turn uh, results in these measurable losses of ecological services and functions. And we have seen this repeatedly in the streams and rivers that drain to Barnegat Bay. And we know that this is a problem that needs to be rectified. The fishery impact, and this is something a lot of times, you know, people do sit up and pay attention when we start talking about a compromised fishery. But as I mentioned previously, that loss of canopy increases the amount of heat uh, that is entering that stream. Uh, and, and as a result of that, that can create some significant uh, impacts to the biota of that water body, uh, starting right from the base of the food chain with a type of algae up into the zooplankton and then into the fish. And then that loss of canopy and riparian vegetation also affects types of food and the availability of food, uh, particularly aquatic insects that are critical for uh, the health and uh, well-being of young fish. Uh, there's also what's called woody debris. Uh, and, and this is the, uh, let's call it the sticks and twigs and uh, limbs that collect in streams naturally. Uh, that provides terrific habitat for the base of our food chain, for the biota that grows within and on uh, that woody debris, but also that creates habitat that's used by fish, various aquatic insects, and amphibians. And then with that increase in uh, disturbance of those edges, the loss of habitat, we end up with bank instability. Uh, and that leads to sedimentation. That ends up impacting habitat uh, that fish require for uh, spawning and even, even nursery. And overall, as I showed you in one of the previous pictures, uh, you end up with an increase in amount of eutrophication because of that added nutrient load that's coming in that's no longer filtered out by all that vegetation along the edges of the stream. And as I mentioned previously, those hydrologic and hydraulic impacts, that loss of flood storage and base flow ends up creating uh, a, a, a degradation to the quality of that waterway that then in turn leads to fishery impacts. And although some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, we need to have a lot of development to see, you know, problems like this development on the on the scale of what you would see maybe in Tom's River or in Lakewood, but that's not really the case. These types of problems really start to manifest uh, with as little as about 15% impervious cover. And 15% impervious cover essentially relates to a, what would be equivalent to low density residential housing, maybe one house to two houses per acre. So it doesn't take a lot of development to start to degrade uh, the riparian buffers and then in turn uh, create impacts uh, to those receiving streams. So, you know, here's what a little bit of runoff can do. And this, you know, these imp the impact of this particular stream, all that bank subsidence, the accumulation of sediment, the loss of canopy cover, and the degradation of the biota of that stream is really just a function of runoff and uh, really uh, exacerbated by the fact that we no longer have a functioning riparian buffer adjacent to that stream. And again, some more evidence of you know, lack of canopy cover, lack of stability. And this is all a function of, of just clearing, mowing, and uh, uh, causing a uh, resulting in a lack of a natural riparian uh, uh, buffer. Again, another photo showing severe bank uh, instability, uh, the collection or accumulation rather of sediment in the stream channel. So how do we avoid these problems? Well, first off, we don't want to disturb or fill riparian buffers. And there are rules on the books, uh, NJDEP uh, 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 guidelines uh, that do prevent or should call for the prevention of uh, disturbance of the riparian buffers. But as we know, uh, you can get variances and exceptions to those rules. And as we've seen uh, pretty much, you know, over the past three, four decades, uh, we have uh, done a pretty good job of disturbing, filling, and altering riparian buffers. 
private property owners, uh, and they may want to see more of a clear view to these streams or, uh, you know, to the water or, or access to the waterways. And as a result of that, they start to remove vegetation or mow down some of those riparian buffers. We don't want to be doing that. And because a lot of these problems are linked directly to proper stormwater management, we need to make sure that not only for new development, but redevelopment and even going back and retrofitting existing development, uh, that we start to practice better stormwater management uh, activities that reduce that volume of runoff, slow down that flow, promote recharge. Those are all things that can be done to start avoiding problems with uh, the degradation of riparian buffers. And then definitely because of that loss of canopy has such a big impact, uh, in protecting the canopy, planting more trees or replanting trees, removing invasive species and replacing those with native species. Those are all a big deal. And in many locations, particularly, you know, the interior, more the interior areas of, of uh, southern New Jersey and the Barnegat Bay watershed, deer management is extremely important as well because deer browse, uh, browse down uh, some of the native species, they get replaced by invasive species, and then that has sort of a trickle-down effect on the quality uh, and functionality of that riparian buffer. So restoration, we can restore, we can do this, we can correct these problems, but in order to correct these problems, we need to develop a lot of data. And the uh, importance of that is we don't want to force fit a solution. There are a lot of, of different things that are on the books uh, that say, okay, if you do this or that, uh, we can enhance a particular riparian area. However, we need to make sure before we do that, that we do have a really good amount of data associated with the site's hydrology, hydraulics, and even the types of vegetation that were there, uh, you know, the native vegetation that we're looking to replace. So too often what ends up happening with restoration plans that are well-intentioned, but don't end up resulting in good results uh, is that uh, we haven't taken the time to do the homework to make sure that we have the data that supports proper restoration design. In summary, riparian buffers do provide a lot of, of ecological services and functions. So they're very important to Barnegat Bay because of their ability to remove pollutants, slow down flood flows, uh, and put more of that precipitation back down into the ground. Uh, this is reflected you know, in DEP's rules uh, and laws that protect riparian buffers from disturbance. But as I mentioned previously, these areas have had a long history of being disturbed, being altered. And this is where what we need to do is come back in and start to restore these areas. The importance of those buffers are really reflected in the scientific literature uh, and also, again, in the rules that DEP has promulgated. The value of those buffers are often underestimated uh, but when you do have a healthy riparian buffer, a healthy riparian zone, then what you end up is with higher quality streams uh, that have a very vibrant uh, ecosystem. All of these things that we typically do and, you know, and maybe don't think about their consequences when it comes to the health of our lakes, uh, streams, waterways, creeks, that are associated with simple agricultural logging, land development uh, pressures, uh, development activities rather, and even simple land maintenance activities such as mowing and clearing of vegetation. Those all have a cumulative negative impact on our riparian buffers. And some of these things, particularly land maintenance activities, uh, can easily be altered and corrected. Uh, so in doing so uh, does protect those riparian lands uh, maintains the health of those streams. And it's something that we need to be doing uh, as part of our overall strategy to improve the water quality of Barnegat Bay. So as I mentioned previously, uh, don't we want to be promoting activities that don't result in the filling or disturbance of riparian buffers. We want to make sure that we're not mowing down our riparian vegetation. We want to be practicing good stormwater management. 
Uh, we want to protect and enhance that tree canopy wherever possible, plant more trees. Uh, and in doing so, as we restore that vegetative zone along our streams, make sure that we're reintroducing native species. And wherever possible, try to control and manage deer to decrease the impacts that they have uh, on these riparian areas. Sustainable riparian restoration uh, is achievable but it does entail designing with nature. And when you design with nature, that means you need to have solid data in hand, uh, physical data about the uh, soils, the hydrology, the hydraulics, uh, uh, information along those lines enables us then to understand what that stream is all about and what that riparian buffer should be all about. Uh, when we design in that capacity, uh, then we're utilizing uh, our understanding of the native ecology of the Barnegat Bay watershed is part of the restoration strategy that we're looking to implement. So healthy riparian buffers equals healthy streams. Healthy streams in turn uh, result in a healthier Barnegat Bay. And all of that uh, is really reflected in our efforts to maintain, uh, restore, uh, and enhance the riparian buffers of the streams, creeks, and waterways that drain to Barnegat Bay. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I like ending on that note. That is something that we talk about a lot in our work kind of behind the scenes, that a big part of our mission is to connect what we call the capillaries that feed into Barnegat Bay. So just as critical as looking at the health of the bay itself is looking at the streams, tributaries, rivers that all run into it. And these are extremely valuable, but very sensitive ecosystems in and of themselves. So hopefully that was enlightening to folks who tuned in. Thank you again, Steve, for being here.